Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. We don't have a sponsor this week, but we do have a Patreon page, which is literally the thing keeping I Know Dino afloat at the moment. So if you'd like to keep the gears turning in I Know Dino, then please head over to patreon.com slash I Know Dino. This week in our 247th episode, we have a bunch of news, including a shiny new dinosaur found in amber. We also have a tyrannosaur footprint from China and some new exhibits. We also have an interview with Professor Annalisa Berta, one of the co-authors on the book Women Invertebrate Paleontology. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Patagonicus. But before we get into all of that, we want to thank some of our patrons who are right now helping to keep the podcast running. And they are Kyle, Brendan Kavanaugh, the Tolbert family, Sean Tanagaki, Remy Rodriguez, Marcy, Rohan, Bradley, Bilal, Avery, Crispy, Joaquin, Jeb from Arkansas, Aiden James, Albertosaurus, and Alan. Yeah, thank you so much. As Garrett mentioned, Patreon is the thing that's keeping us and the podcast going, so we appreciate all of your support. And we've got a lot of good things coming up, especially we're going to hit our milestone 250th episode, and we're going to SVP in Australia, so... If you want to join this group of amazing people and supporting the podcast, then check out our page at patreon.com slash I Dino. Jumping into the news, up first is our new dinosaur that was found in amber. This find was published in Current Biology by Lita Shing, Jingmei O'Connor, and others, because of course Jingmei is on it. <laughs> she apparently is involved with all the most exciting research happening in China. Yeah, well, there's a lot, a lot going on. Yes. And this paper is also very well written, which I think might have a lot to do with Jing Mei O'Connor and why she's the second author on it, because it has a similar tone to some of the other papers I've read of hers recently. And the authors give a really good synopsis of what dinosaurs we've found in amber lately, saying, quote, so far, five bird specimens have been described from Burmese amber, two isolated wings, an isolated foot with wing fragment, and two partial skeletons, end quote. Of course, we've covered all of those over the last few years, and they are all amazing in their own way. There's also a tail that was in the mix too, which is really cool. That might be what's the partial skeleton could be one of those. This new dinosaur is named Alector Ornus Chungwangai, and Alector means amber, so Alector Ornus means amber bird. It's a pretty good name for a bird found in amber. Yeah. <laughs> it is r really a dinosaur too because it's an enantiornithine. So it's a toothed bird and these went extinct. They didn't evolve into modern birds. So depending on where you d draw your line, um, what is a bird and what isn't a bird, you know, if you're a bird purist, you might not consider this a real bird. I don't know. Then Chung Guangai is after a curator who works at the Hupoga Amber Museum. And I have not heard of this museum. I tried to look it up and couldn't find anything about it. Sounds like it has to do with amber. Yeah, I think maybe it's in Myanmar and that's why I can't find it. A lot of times more rural museums can be really hard to find. Might not actually be rural for all I know. Could be in some major city. But in any event, this new piece of amber is really cool. It has a partial leg as well as some feather in it. And the feather looks like it's the right shape for flight. So... That gives you a clue that it was probably flying. It has that asymmetry and everything to it. But most of the paper is really focused on the foot because that's the unique thing that gave it its name. So we had to compare the foot, <laughs> this amber trapped foot, to a bunch of other dinosaur feet to see if it warranted its own genus. And it did because the foot is really interesting. So it has four toes which isn't too surprising. It looks like it would have been really good at perching because the first toe, also known as the hallux, looks a lot like modern bird feet where they do a lot of perching. It is 180 degrees almost from the other three toes. It sticks out the back, so it gets that good grabbing action for a branch that it's perched on. And one of the unique things about Alector Ornus is that its hallux is longer than some of its close relatives, so maybe it was extra good at grasping branches and perching. But cooler to me than that is the fact that since it was in amber, it preserved the keratin sheaths on its claws. And they saw that the keratin sheaths covering the bone claw, the bone part of the claw, made them about 33% longer 
than just the bones alone would be. So if you look at any enantiornithines now, you might be able to assume that you take its claw and add another third to it, and that's how long it actually would have been. It's quite a bit longer. Yes, and a lot sharper, <laughs> because that's what happens when you can grow a fingernail, can come to a finer point. It also had really interesting scales on its feet. They were very small, around 0.1 millimeter in diameter, as well as significantly smaller than that. <laughs> so basically indistinguishable from skin at that point, but it looks really cool under magnification, obviously. And of the three toes that are facing forward, because we have the hallux facing backwards, but then you have more of a typical looking theropod, three toes facing forward, the middle toe is much longer than the other two. And when you combine that extra long middle toe and the long hallux, it's definitely a unique characteristic, which is why it got its own name. And they came up with some really interesting ideas for why the middle toe might be longer, which are obviously all very speculative because we can't test what it was doing. One of the guesses is that maybe it was for climbing trees. The authors point out that there are some tree climbing lizards that have long toes. So maybe a lector ornus had a long toe for doing just exactly the same thing, wrapping around a branch or bark or something a little bit better with a longer toe. They also <laughs> pointed to something we've talked about a lot, which is a similarity to an eye eye, that weird lemur that eats bugs that <laughs> keeps coming up. We talked about it with hands on some other dinosaurs, which may have actually been wings, but we're not sure. It's been proposed that they had these really long fingers for digging into things. And they're saying, well, maybe a lector ornus used a toe, like how an eye eye uses a weird finger to dig inside a little insect burrow or down a tree or into a little gap somewhere to fish out a grub or some other insects. Interesting that lemurs and dinosaurs have so much in common. <laughs> yeah, it seems like everybody's noticing the similarity with the long, weird digits that keep popping up on these dinosaurs. It's weird, especially weird to think of it on a foot, though. Even more interesting to me is that there are also these small hair-like scutellae scale filaments, also known as SSFs, on the foot and toes. And this is something you'd never see fossilized because... They're basically like fine hairs sticking out of the fossil. But when it's in amber, you get to see this really amazing detail. So they also put out some guesses at what those might have been used for. They said possibly it could have been used for increased traction in a wet forest since wet leaves are very slippery. It's kind of similar to the sauropod claw hypothesis that Ashley and Lee Hall explained to us, you know, get a little extra traction. But now we think that it was used for digging, although it's hard to use hair for digging. <laughs> they also said that it could possibly be mechanosensory tactile function. And they cited a paper, which I had to read by Susan Cunningham and others. And in it, they describe that a lot of birds have avian facial bristles. They were trying to figure out what they have them for. They kind of look like whiskers. You see them on kiwi birds. That was one of the main ones in their study. Kind of things sticking out from their head. They look just like whiskers, basically. But they're obviously not whiskers because birds don't have mammalian hair. They grow these weird scutellae scale filaments, basically like a hair, except it's made out of the same stuff as a feather. And it sticks out from in between scales. So. What Cunningham and her co-authors found was that these facial bristles may have been used for, quote, prey handling, gathering information during flight, navigating in nest cavities and on the ground at night, and possibly in prey detection, end quote. That's a lot of things. Yeah, it's really fascinating. So for prey handling, it's basically if you're holding prey, but you can't see exactly how it's moving, but maybe your bristles can help you feel how it's moving and you can respond so it doesn't get away from you. Is that similar to a cat's whiskers? I think so. I, I've heard with mammalian whiskers, a lot of times it gives the animal information about their width, that a lot of times their whiskers are equal in width to the widest part of their body. Mm -hmm. So if their whiskers don't touch something, then they know they can squeeze through it. Okay. So that's kind of like the navigating and nest cavities part. Yeah. Or, and I think in that case, they also might be thinking it's more of like a 
when you're walking in a dark room and you put your hands out so you don't bash face first into something. Mm, as feelers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then there's gathering information during flight, which is really interesting too. It'd be like a windsock sort of thing is my guess at what that would do. You might be able to feel where the wind is going and react. But prey detection, I think, is really the one that they're thinking about, especially with the eye-eye comparison, because what they found was that the longest and biggest SSFs are on the end of the long toe. So if you imagine you're sticking a toe into a crevice and that toe has its own little whiskers on it and it can feel real sensitive detail about what it's sticking into, maybe it can tell if there's a little grub in there that it wants to grab onto. It's like having an eye on the end of a finger so you can see what's going on, feel it rather than having to see it. So they're like little bug feeler hairs, potentially. Hey, whatever gives them the advantage. Yeah. And this is all very speculative. They do know that those SSFs are there. We're just not sure exactly what they're for. I like the feeling for bugs in a tunnel with your toe. <laughs> It's just like the strangest thing you'd never make up. So in other news from China, in Jiangxi province, there's a team of paleontologists that have found a Tyrannosaurus footprint fossil, which is the first one found in China. And these are fossilized footprints from a Tyrannosaur. These particular ones are from the late Cretaceous. Most dinosaur tracks found in China are from the Jurassic or early Cretaceous. The footprint is about 23 inches, 58 centimeters long, and 18 and a half inches wide. And this track was found during road construction in Guangzhou. Many things are found in Guangzhou. You probably hear us talking about it a lot. Xing Lida said that the footprint is different from other theropod footprints found in China, but, quote, bears a strong resemblance to the Tyrannosaur tracks found in the United States, end quote. And so they think that based on the tracks, the Tyrannosaur could be as long as 24.6 feet, seven and a half meters, which is similar in size to Changosaurus the Pinocchio Rex dinosaur that was discovered not too long ago. This footprint was found about 20 miles or 33 kilometers away from where Changosaurus fossils were found. So it is possible that it belongs to Changosaurus, but it's really hard to know for sure what dinosaur made what footprint. Yeah, we can't even really be completely sure that Tyrannosaurus pus was made by a Tyrannosaur. <laughs> we think it is. They all look like they should be from a tyrannosaur, but there could be a new dinosaur that we haven't seen yet. True. It's actually making them. But based on what we know and then the size and the shape and everything, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, if you happen to visit the Yingliang Stone Nature History Museum in Fujian province, you can see this fossil. Awesome. That's cool. It's already on display. Mm -hmm. It's not that big for a tyrannosaur track. Obviously, a 24-foot long tyrannosaur isn't nearly as big as they got because T-Rex is more like 40 feet right. at fully grown. But it's big for China. Yeah. In museum news, on August 26th to 30th, the Great Plains Dinosaur Museum is offering a dinosaur dig program for adults and kids in Malta, Montana. And you can dig with paleontologists from the museum and from Two Medicine Dinosaur Center and learn about local geology, surveying techniques, as well as how to safely collect and transport fossils. Sounds like a good program. In Leeds City Center in the UK, shoppers can see five animatronic dinosaurs over the next few weeks. The dinosaurs are T-Rex, Triceratops, Velociraptor, Apatosaurus, and Carnotaurus. It's a good mix. In the game Fortnite, in Season 10, there's weekly missions, and one of them is a road trip mission challenge where you just need to visit the desert biome, and that's where you can see dinosaurs. And these dinosaurs are meant to be kind of kitschy, kind of roadside attraction types. And in one of the Pictures I saw, there's a large pink triceratops, which didn't look that kitschy to me. It looked kind of cool. <laughs> like it, the facial expression it had was like, yeah, I'm a cool dinosaur. Oh, interesting. And last, Toei Animation is making a short animated series set in a modern world full of prehistoric animals. And it's anime. It's called Jurassic. It comes out sometime in August. I couldn't find too many details, but it's based on a picture book. And there were some images out. So it's not just dinosaurs. There's also pteranodons and other things. But it looks really cool. Yeah, that is cool. I really like recreations of the Mesozoic in all sorts of forms. Even in the modern world? Oh, I miss that. <laughs> <laughs> so I wonder, it's a modern world full of prehistoric animals. And right. it's called Jurassic. So in the pictures that I've seen so far, it looks like Tokyo or some major city. And then you've got 
a pteranodon flying above a bridge and things like that, or dinosaurs wandering around. And So it's like a hypothetical situation where dinosaurs didn't go extinct, but humans managed to evolve somehow. So we all just coexist. I don't know any of the other details, just that it's based on a book <laughs> and it's coming out soon. If they weren't terrorizing everybody, that's what it sounds like to me. Because if they, you know, got loose out of a lab or something, you'd expect it to be a not just a calm scene in the city. Could be. It looked to me like they just coexisted. Yeah. So I don't know what the details are. Just like we do with birds. We'll have to see when it comes out. Yeah, keep a lookout. If anybody watches it, let us know what you think. Or where we can watch it <laughs> if yeah. we don't find out first. <laughs> Before we get into our interview, we want to remind you all that we have a Patreon. You can join it and chat with us as well as fellow dinosaur fans. There are tons of good discussions on there. There's been a lot of talk recently about travels. People are traveling to museums all over the place. So there's a lot of tips being shared on which museums to go to and how to get there. And there's always people willing to give suggestions too. So definitely head over to Patreon and sign up if you're planning a dinosaur trip and you want to talk about it. And of course, there are lots of other rewards as well, like getting a shout out on the show or getting an ad free version. And all of it can be found at patreon.com slash I know dino. And now for our interview with Annalisa. We get to chat today with Professor Annalisa Berta, who is a paleontologist and professor emerita at San Diego State University in the Department of Biology, and her research is focused on the evolution and fossil history of marine mammals, including whales and dolphins. And she's worked on a number of books, including Whales, Dolphins, and Porpoises, and Marine Mammals Evolutionary Biology. She's also the co-author, along with Dr. Susan Turner, of the upcoming book, Women in Vertebrate Paleontology, which is a history of women bone hunters, and it includes women from the late 18th century to present day. Well, thanks so much for chatting with us today. Sure. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask, what's the inspiration behind the Women in Vertebrate Paleontology book? Well, I've been a vertebrate paleontologist for, gee, I guess about 40 years now. And I'm kind of winding down on my research. And I really felt like it was important for the younger generations to know something about the history of women that have been in our field, the fate, the challenges that we've all faced and, you know, how these women have dealt with various situations. Yeah, that's really great. I think most people know about Mary Anning and then there's probably a very long gap before they know about any more recent <laughs> paleontologists. So it's nice that you get to fill in some of the gaps there. Yeah, it has been really quite a challenge for both of us. In the very beginning, yeah, you're right, Mary Anning, the very first English paleontologist um, really discovering fossils, I guess, when she was a child. So really around 1810 or so. And then there is a gap. And then, of course, women, Mariani didn't have a formal education, mm -hmm. but she was really good at finding fossils. Mm -hmm. And so as is the case for not just Mary, but a number of other women collectors, they found the fossils and then turned them over to various geologists and paleontologists males, of course, at the time. And so it really wasn't until, you know, later in the century, really the, the late 1800s, when education opened up, universities started accepting women. And so you started getting women that were formally trained in paleontology. But they're really, you're right, the, the very early women that were doing the collecting, um, some of them had an education, or they were from wealthy families. And so they were able to go out collecting and acquire collections from, you know, had the money to be able to acquire collections from individuals. And then they would share their fossils with the noted geologists and paleontologists of the time. And they were all, you know, they were very excited about what they were finding, but they really weren't able to, you know, talk about their results. They were kind of barred, mm -hmm. at, at least initially, from scientific societies. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Although their discoveries were recognized by these paleontologists and geologists as being very significant, but usually, you know, the, the, the males had the education to really be able to write the material up. Right? Oh, understood. So it, it might be kind of like the present day where somebody writes up the paper and they're the lead author. And then there's kind of a footnote in the systematic paleontology about this person found the fossil. Exactly. Same thing. So then in terms of 
figuring out who these women were and their contributions is it just a matter of going through all of the papers and looking for names? Well, that's um, one of the reasons why it's been so useful for me to have a co-author. Um, Susan Turner is a fish paleontologist. Uh, she was trained in Britain, and then she moved, I believe, in the 70s to Australia. But in any case, she's done a lot of work on sort of the history of women in geoscience. And she also has much more of an international uh, approach than I did. I didn't know as many people, vertebrate paleontologists, that she did. So especially the Soviet women and the women from China. Oh, so yeah. she's added she's added significantly to the to the scope of this. Of course, I know the American women because, you know, SVP. I go to the mm-hmm. <laughs> Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting every year. So it's like a, you know, I don't know, a high school reunion, but for me it's been a 40-year high school reunion. <laughs> a little yeah. <laughs> so I get to see all the you know, the many of the students that I went to graduate school with, and we exchange ideas and talk about research and such. So having Susan on has been really um, very helpful because, as I said, she brought an international scope to it. And also her background, having written about women in geoscience, was very helpful. Yeah, that's really great. I was I really wanted to ask you, too, with the communist <laughs> rule or whatever it was, but I noticed that there were a lot of women in paleontology in Russia and Mongolia and places like that back in the earlier part of the 20th century, whereas you didn't see that as much in other Western countries. Is that Was that true or is that just my wrong no, perception no, of it? No, no, absolutely correct. Women uh, in the Soviet, in the well, Imperial Russia first and then later uh, the Soviet Union, women were really recognized and, and encouraged in science, to go into science. And it's true, there were many some of the early paleontologists actually were Russian scientists. So that that's true. And, and, you know, it's also been kind of interesting, the different specialties of vertebrate paleontology, some of them have a, a history that goes along with a country. And for example, that's why Susan has been instrumental in this book writing is because she's a fish paleontologist. And that's, that's one of the areas that the early women, Soviet women, sort of went into was fish paleontology Mm -hmm. because they have incredible deposits there. And also, as I said, they were, there was a lot of encouragement for um, going out and and doing field work and exploring and, and describing the fossil remains that they discovered. Awesome. Have there been any surprises that have come out of it? Um, I guess probably the biggest surprise for me is that I just, it's been really heartening to see the, the increase in number of women. Uh, And I certainly see this, uh, when I go to meetings, I see an increase in number of women giving presentations, writing papers, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess one one of the things I would say is it's it's heartening to see the increase in the number of women participating in vertebrate paleontology. But it's just the progress has been has been rather slow, mm-hmm. and and I didn't wouldn't have really realized that. I think probably because I was kind of caught up in it. I mean, my first meeting was in the middle 1970s. And when I look back on it now, I mean, I formed some really good friendship, but it was with women, Mm -hmm. but it was probably half a dozen women. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody else was male at that time. And then, you know, more recently, you've certainly seen a a great increase in number of women participating in the meeting. But still, if you look, and that is one part of the book is that we've looked at, we have a chapter on challenges and opportunities. And when you look at sort of do a statistical treatment of of some of the numbers here, you find out that even though you see a lot of women at these meetings, there really aren't the proportion of women that are members of the society is really only about a third of the society. And of that, the majority of the members are student members. So there's an increase in the number of students, but it doesn't really translate to at the you know, professional paleontologist level. Right. There aren't that many women that are actually find full-time employment in paleontology. I mean, of course, it's a very, what's good, especially today, is that it's a very diverse field. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, it started out with a really strong background in geology. And that's where where uh, people got jobs, where was in geology departments. But now, you know, there's anthropology, there's chemistry, there's physics, there's all these different applications 
and different sub-disciplines of paleontology. So there's other places for employment. And I guess if you're really passionate about the field and you really know that's what you want to do, you have to be willing to take advantage of different opportunities. Not everybody can go and be a professor in paleontology. But there's lots of other possibilities. Like you could be a park paleontologist, or you could work for a or government agency, the BLM, something like that. Yeah. And a number of a number of women have actually uh, been successful and have you know have found themselves maybe teaching gross anatomy <laughs> and still doing research on fossils. So it's a good time. Yeah. Well, I was going to say because we got to talk to you briefly at SVP, but you know it, it gets a little bit crazy. But at the poster <laughs> sessions, <laughs> right? And you had the poster about this book, and yeah, it seemed like the the definition of women in vertebrate paleontology was pretty broad and inclusive. Right, right. And I mean, if you look at, I was just did some, looked at the, what we've got so far. So we have the book itself is divided up into seven chapters. And the first chapter is really what vertebrate paleontology is as a science, its Mm. development. And then we talk a little bit about, you know, the development of the different paleontologic organizations. And then the next several chapters of the different time slices and the women in those time periods, vertebrate paleontologists, of course, and then the contributions that they've made. And then there's a chapter in the back about where we are, you know, what the future looks like, that sort of thing. So that's where the challenges and the opportunities are. But yes, you can see in the very beginning, the first chapter, I think, takes place in the late in the 18th century early 19th century. And you see, I think we profile maybe 15 women. And by the end, the last chronological slight time slice, um, we're looking at, this is the 21st century. So mm-hmm. the last 20 years, essentially, we're talking about there being 80 women. So, I mean, the number has just increased dramatically. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Do you see... I don't know if there's enough people to really know at this scale, but I know in general there's a problem where women, when they're in a profession, tend to siloed in like a, a lower role and it can be difficult for them to make it up to in the for-profit world up to like a CEO or sort of that level. Do you see the same kind of thing in paleontology or do you think it might be more equal? Well, I think, again, it's changing. Originally, it was, you know, more difficult for women to not only just find positions, but to get uh, tenure and promotion and advancement. But, you know, it's becoming a more level playing field. I would still say we have a long way to go, but at least, uh, especially in this Me Too moment, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of momentum to make sure that that things are uh, are fairer. Yeah, that's great. So had you and... Susan worked together before, or how did this partnership come about? Uh, no, we had never worked before. Um, I we had just been, you know, of course, I was thinking about the book, and I actually proposed it to Johns Hopkins nearly two years ago. And I felt a little bit challenged because most of the work I've done has really been on marine mammal research, not mm-hmm. on history, history of science or history of women in science. And somebody, when I was talking this over at a meeting, just suggested that. I contact Susan and I had read some of the papers. She's written really quite a few papers on women in vertebrate paleontology. So I knew she had uh, a familiarity and background of women in geoscience. And then just a part of that, of course, we were going to focus on the specifically women in uh, VP. Mm-hmm. So again, we took her lead. I mean, she wrote a broader article looking at women geoscientists, and then we just focused on uh, women in VP. But it's been, you know, we also have an online database where we've been accumulating names of women who have made contributions uh, to the field through time. And that's another area that we're going to be in the book. We'll discuss it and talk about uh, some of the different statistics. For example, are there more women you know, that study dinosaurs, then study fish. I mean, those are the kind of things that we'll look at, be able to look at through these different intervals, these different time slices. And I, I haven't worked it all up yet. Susan and I have, we're working kind of with different, it was the same, it's a, it's a very large list of women. And it, the question really is, you know, how do you define a measurable contribution? Oh, right. Yeah. And, 
And so <laughs> I would, uh, we could have, you know, I've pared down the list. So we have, it, it, it's probably a very conservative estimate would be a thousand women and a more liberal interpretation of measurable contribution would put us at maybe 1,700, 1,800 women. Oof. And again, I'm, yeah, I know the, the, the figures vary widely, but I'm tending to look more toward not just attending a meeting, but in order to be on the list, you actually have to give, have given a presentation or have a publication or some kind, like I said, measurable contribution. Mm -hmm. So what the other thing is, I should have mentioned this is also included on that list is uh, women that have, that have either done research or are pursuing research in uh, vertebrate paleontology, but we're also including uh, the preparators, artists, collections managers, all of those other uh, folks that are so important to the field. Yeah, yeah, and that really widens it. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's been challenging to you know we're again tr we can't cover everybody, <laughs> but <laughs> right. but it's yeah that's what I it, it is a challenge to try to cover people, especially outside of, say, U.S. and Europe. Mm -hmm. And so trying to make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible. And of course, we're not going to, you know, we can't cover everybody in there. But this online database, part of it will be in the book. And then it's something that we hope to, you know, have it live somewhere on the web so that People can look to it and add to it and correct it and revise it because, you know, it's only as good as the people that are on there and, and actively using it. Mm -hmm. One other thing I wanted to mention is that at the last SVP meeting, Susan wasn't able to attend it, but I was there and I uh, we interviewed uh, 18 women really that represent a cross section of the society. So we had students as well as senior uh, researchers and we interviewed them about uh, their experiences in VP. And these, these were videotaped interviews. And so that the videotape is going to be put on the website. And I've gone ahead and transcribed uh, the interviews and added photos and things. And so that is going to be another part of the book will be highlights from those women vertebrate paleontologists that we were actually able to interview at the last meeting. Great. Yeah. That's good. Then you get a little bit of interactivity, a little. It's almost like a census. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, what you get, what you get is the just all of the the various challenges that they've had, and and you know something more about not just their you know sort of scientific contributions, but how they've made you know vertebrate paleontology has fit into their lives. I mean, mm -hmm. some of these women have had children. They've taken their children into the field, and they've been very you know just. Oftentimes we think of having children, taking them in the field, that's a big challenge. But many of these women have looked at, upon that challenge and kind of embraced it and said, yeah, but they get to, you know, they get to learn about the outside. They get to be with other, you know, socialize with others, with students and people with different backgrounds. And so they've made it a really uh, a positive experience instead of looking at it as like, you know, wow, I've got to take my kid in the field. <laughs> it's a negative, <laughs> negative kind of thing. They've turned it around and made it like, wow, I, you know, this is a very rewarding experience for my, for my child. Yeah. It also enhances everything because it's one thing to read about these things, but it's a totally different to right. see and hear. Yeah. Someone's experiences. Right. Well, for our listeners, if they wanted to find out more about you and your work or maybe keep an eye out on when your book comes out, where's, where's the best place for them to find you? I have a, a website at, at San Diego State University, so they could just Google Google me and it'll, <laughs> the website will come up. I don't know what off the top of my head. We can provide a link. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today to chat with us. Sure, Sabrina. You're welcome. Thanks again, Annalisa. It was really great to hear about what's going on with this book and all the work that has gone into it so far, and we're really looking forward to reading it when it comes out and learning more about women in paleontology. And now on to our dinosaur of the day, Patagonicus, which was a request from Dinosaur 4602, so thank you. It was an alvarosaur that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now Argentina in the Portezuelo Formation. Patagonicus is estimated to be six and a half feet or two meters long, 
The holotype's incomplete, and it includes vertebrae, a partial forelimb, pelvic girdle, and hind limbs, but no skull. Patagonicus probably ate insects. Alvarosaurs are small and bipedal, and they probably ate insects. And alvarosaurs also had short, robust forelimbs. The type species is Patagonicus puertae, and the genus name means Patagonian claw. It was described in 1996 by Novus, and in 2003, a second specimen was found, but they only found one digit from its finger, so not much. Other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place as Patagonicus include Megaraptor, Rhinconsaurus, and Antarctosaurus. That one's short but sweet. And our fun fact of the day might be even longer than our dinosaur of the day, but... <laughs> Happens sometimes. Yeah. It's that just by looking at Tarbosaurus teeth, we can tell that what is now the Gobi Desert was probably once a forest full of conifer trees, which are things like redwoods, pine, and cedar. So Tarbosaurus, as a quick reminder, is the Asian Tyrannosaurus, it's often called. It's about as big as T-Rex. It was living maybe just a little bit before T-Rex or maybe at the exact same time. It's hard to say because of differences in where we find them. This recent research on Tarbosaurus teeth was published by Paleogeography, Paleoclimatology, and Paleoecology, and it was written by Shishtof Awaski and others. And in it, they cut into five Tarbosaurus teeth and measured the oxygen and carbon isotopes. Each of them led to a different conclusion. So the oxygen isotopes revealed a cool and, quote, monsoon-influenced climate, end quote. You might be familiar with using oxygen isotopes as a sort of paleo thermometer. I think we've talked about that in the past. And the carbon-13 in herbivores and carnivores led them to the coniferous trees conclusion. And by that, I mean that this sort of signature of carbon-13 must be more present in conifer trees and then obviously the plant eaters that eat the conifer trees and therefore Tarbosaurus when it eats the plant eaters that eat the trees which absorb the carbon-13. And based on that, the researchers point out that this seems to be supporting evidence that Tarbosaurus probably ate sauropods and large hadrosaurs, as has previously been hypothesized. As an aside, one other thing that they noticed was that based on the growth lines in the teeth, they think that Tarbosaurus grew a new set of teeth about once a year, or potentially slightly more often, like every two-thirds of a year, like eight months. Sometimes I wish humans could do that. It would be really cool. These teeth are huge too, like bigger than all our teeth combined, just a single tooth. But it would give us kind of janky smiles, <laughs> having teeth falling out all the time. True. That's the one downside. It's only cute when you're a kid. Yeah. Or we we probably wouldn't think it was unusual to just have missing teeth. It'd be like, yeah, and teeth come and go. That's what happens. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes. Also, if you want to join our growing community, check out our page, patreon.com slash I Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.